Morning, everybody. This is Tim Melvin of Banking on Profits coming to you from down here in Central Florida. A little overcast down here this morning. I understand it's going to clear up later, you know, but we're going to have rain and stuff for a week, so it's going to be another crazy week down here for weather-wise. Always is this time of year. We're transitioning from rainy to dry, and so the weather will be a little bit weird, but that's okay. We love it here anyway. Anyway, guys, it's going to be a different open than what we had planned, okay? We... Had a fantastic weekend around here. We really did. Um, just just lots going on, lots of good stuff, lots of good books. Of course, end of the year baseball, we had a lot of fun with that. Navy and Notre Dame both won. My, my wife got to dig out uh, all the Halloween yard tchotchkes uh, to replace all those we took in when Irma hit a few weeks ago. Uh, so we, you know, we got the whole haunted house thing going on out front. We went out to a fantastic dinner. We did our little Disney Springs sneak around thing, and uh, we love to do that. We go to Disney Springs, used to be called Downtown Disney. We go down early, okay, like at about 5 o'clock, and then we just go around, no reservations anywhere, and we see where we can get a seat at the bar. Sometimes we even get a table. It's a lot of fun. You know, no agenda. Can't do it much too late. If you go about 8 o'clock, it's wall-to-wall. Every seat at the bar is taken. The restaurants are full. But if you do kind of the early bird thing, you can get a great seat and then, you know, take in a movie there at the theater or, or whatever, have a drink at some of the, uh, you know, really nice establishments in the Disney area. So we did that. We went to the new Paddlefish, uh, ate at the rooftop bar, uh, had a fantastic experience. So far, they're winning the clam chowder contest by a wide margin over every other restaurant in town. So if you get down there, check out Paddlefish. The food was fantastic. The people were wonderful. Uh, and you know what? We deserved that or we needed it might be a better word after the past uh, couple of months. We have my father-in-law being, you know, dead on ground zero in Rockport when a Harvey came ashore. Of course, you know, we've got relatives down there. In the Houston, Rockport, Victoria area, so a lot of concern. Then, of course, we had Irma. We took absolutely no damage, but, you know, we lost power for, you know, not about a day. It's no big deal. These schools were closed for a few extra days. Didn't really affect us. Other parts of the town and the state, of course, were hit pretty hard. Then we had the school lockdown at my 14-year-old's um, high school. Uh, reports of a shooter. Turned out to be two kids being stupid, but still, you know, tense couple hours. So, we were grateful for a very nice weekend. That was really, that was going to be pretty much all, you know, what I talked about this morning. And then I turned on the news. Wow. Las Vegas, over 50 dead, over 200 wounded. Um, it's horrifying. Uh, I'm not going to throw out empty prayers and condolences. You can send a truck full of those. They won't help anybody. Um, but this is one of the most horrific events in U.S. history. It's worse than the Pulse shooting here in Orlando a few years ago. And we don't know much. It's um, it's a few minutes after nine on the East Coast here. We know who the shooter was. That's all we know. We'll be watching it following developments as we go through the day. Uh, there were several attacks, one in Edmonton, uh, one in Paris. They're all terrorists, maybe different groups, different motivations. We don't we don't know anything about this guy. What horrifies me, I can have my comments about the economics of the NFL protest upset you last week. And this is going to really upset you, but it has to be said, in my opinion, so I'm going to say it. From the start, I got up at a, yeah, a little after 7 this morning. I walked the dog, got my coffee, came back in. That's when I turned the news on, saw what was happening. When I flipped to social media, at quarter to 8 this morning, people were already making political football out of what happened in Las Vegas. We don't even really know what happened in Las Vegas or why it happened, and people are politicizing the event. So now before we move on to the good, normal, fun stuff, I'm just going to suggest to you that if you are politicizing what happened in Las Vegas last night, you really need to check how the current political environment and turmoil has changed you as a person because there's just something deeply wrong and disturbing about politicizing this horrifying event before we know anything that happened. Okay, moving on. We're going to get back to the good, regular stuff now. So. Looking into the weekend, we've been doing a lot of work on expected returns. No, that's not forecasting. I don't forecast. Okay? I'm not going to say, look at this line on this chart. This is going to happen. Boom, terrible things. You know, right away, get short. Go. I don't do that. Okay? I can't predict what the market's going to do. But we can use a little math and figure out what the expected returns from the current point in the market are. And I read some work by GMO. Of course, they're one of the best at it. Uh, James Montier has had some sharp comments in a white paper he released um, 
recently that was like this, the theme, I forget the exact title, was like S&P No. <laughs> and Guggenheim Partners, um, the uh, investment firm who I have a lot of respect for, uh, came out last week with a report on expected returns going forward. And it's not pretty. Just as everybody rushes to stock and bond index funds, the expected returns on stock and bond index funds over the next decade is actually pretty dismal. If you take this starting point using any number of measures, trailing pr price to earnings, the uh, somewhat controversial Schiller price to earnings ratio, or market cap to GDP, and you look forward, the expected return from this level, less than zero. And there's different degrees of less than zero. Some think it'll be lots less. Some think it'll be just a little less. But a decade of less than zero, not good. And historical research has shown us that the starting yield on a bond portfolio, pretty good indicator of what the total return will be over the next decade. That puts you at 240, 250, 2.5%. Two so, you know, 60 40 mix of stocks and bonds is going to get clobbered in here over the next 10 years because you're just starting at such inflated levels, according to Guggenheim and GMO. I happen to agree with them. We are very high. I don't, as Sam Zell is fond of saying, I don't see the demand to really kick start this economy and get things growing at a pace that's going to justify the, today's current valuations. Now, if interest rates stay down here forever, maybe you can make a case that the markets are fairly valued. You can't make a case, as I've said on and on and on, that these markets are cheap and worth, worthy of uh, massive blind investment and just throwing money at the market, which, by the way, is what you're doing when you buy an index fund. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll see how it all plays out, but we do continue to have a very dangerous background. Now, looking at our portfolio, our stocks are doing pretty good. Okay, it's Some of them, if I have a concern, it's that some of them have started to act like momentum stocks. We just sold a stock that was up 24% over the last month. It was up 10% last week. No news, just money pouring into the community bank sector, kind of a hot money trade again, and it's pushing these things up too far too fast. Now, my magic threshold is two times tangible book value. It went over two times book. We sold the stock. Uh, most of the rest of our stocks, we've had a couple others that are you know, exhibiting those momentum uh, traits, but they're still pretty reasonably priced. You know, We bought them below 90% of book. They're trading at 140, 150% of book. We're monitoring that, but they're not at the nosebleed levels where I just can't take it anymore and sell the stock. So we're monitoring it. We're watching some of this, these little Momos uh, banks. And if they get to two times book value, they're going bye-bye uh, and out of the portfolio. Right now, we're still just going to sit back and enjoy the ride because most of our portfolio, pretty reasonably priced. After selling that stock in the main portfolio, we do, we've do we got over 20% cash. We've got a tail hedge in place. So we're just going to let all this play out over the next happen until it's time to consider redoing the hedge in January of next year. We'll make that decision at that time. Now, UBS came out with a fantastic piece uh, over the weekend, and it talked about real estate values in gateway markets around the world. It's Stockholm, Sydney, you know, some of the other markets mentioned, but they don't have any real impact on us as community bank investors here in the United States. They did identify that San Francisco and Los Angeles are really overvalued commercial real estate markets. Uh, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. The prices are some, somewhat ridiculous. Um, it did say to my surprise that New York City and Boston are fairly valued. Now, I thought it was a little frothier than that, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. So that those are fairly valued. And New York in particular has shown some, some signs of weakness of late. So... Um, we'll see how that plays out. Now, commercial real estate is important to us, as is residential real estate, because those are the two major collateral classifications standing behind the loans that our small banks make. Um, most of our banks are not in the New York City or Boston area. We don't have a lot of exposure to Los Angeles or San Francisco. Most of our banks are suburbs and out, so we don't have a lot of core downtown real estate in our bank portfolio. Our general view or my general view of the commercial real estate market right now is that, um, you know, it's probably not a great time to be a buyer. There's not a lot of bargains in commercial real estate. But it's a pretty good time to be a lender because the economy is, you know, it's not gangbusters. I've said that continuously that, you know, we're stuck in a long cycle of better but not great. Uh, but it is 
kind of perking along. Occupancy levels are decent. Rents are stable. They're not going down. Financing costs are still extraordinarily low. You can roll your debt over at very low interest rates. So it's kind of a, you know, just a nice environment. We may not see the appreciation rates that we've seen over the, since the credit crisis continue, but I don't think we're going to see anything where real estate prices begin to move a lot lower, damaging collateral values and putting loan portfolios in jeopardy. So not a great buyer's market, but a pretty good lender's market. And since we own bank stocks, that makes us, uh, puts us solidly in the lending business. So we're okay with where commercial real estate markets are right now and how they affect our overall bank stock portfolio. Major risks of this market, really there's, there's geopolitical risks and you accept Catalonia and Spain over this weekend, violence related to a potential vote for independence there. Mr. Putin still sits in Moscow. He's always a wild card. Still a crazy man in North Korea, uh, talking about uh, shooting off rockets and nuclear missiles and all kinds of crazy stuff. Our government is now saying, hey, we're not going to negotiate. Uh, you know, if North Korea goes up, it's going to be a mess. The relationship between the United States and China, one of the key relationships in the world today, is going to be very challenged. Uh, of course, there'll be huge risks to Japan in that scenario. So we just got to sit back and see how that plays out. Not really any way to protect ourselves against that other than the tail hedge that we have in place. Biggest risk right now, given what's going on in the economy, in the real estate markets, uh, in corporate America, is geopolitical in nature. And uh, nothing we can really do to protect ourselves against that except, again, the tail hedge and uh, really inflated sense of caution when it comes to putting their money to work. Uh, the other risk, of course, is um, the Fed tightening. And here again, never been done before. The Fed's never had to shrink a balance sheet this large. We don't know what's going to happen. It could cause a spike in interest rates. Bad for the overall market, possibly good for small banks because net interest margins will go up. Uh, but we don't really know what's going to happen. And, you know, this market has shown an ability to deal with just about anything. So maybe it just says, okay, so the Fed's tightening and we'll just go along and, you know, big bond buy buyers out of the market, but uh, rates will go up a little bit, but we can deal with that. We don't know what's going to happen. No one else does. If someone says that they do, they're either a liar or a fool and to be avoided at all costs. So markets just kind of plugging along. We'll see how it all plays out. We're in a great position right now. We did have another bank stock portfolio uh, taken over in our portfolio, the main portfolio week when Bay Banks was taken over by Old Line Bank there in Maryland as Old Line increases its presence in the Baltimore market. Uh, we made almost 200% on that particular pick. So it was one of our better ones, although we really like management. So we're kind of sorry to see the stock go, but tremendous return in that stock. M&A is going to pick up for all the same reasons that we've talked about. Uh, you know, tired banker syndrome, I certainly think as I talk to bankers during the course of business day to day, that's huge. Banking's not fun. It's a tough business. You're dealing with regulatory issues. Cybersecurity is a nightmare. Uh, net interest margins are still very compressed and at historic lows. You know, some bright spots, they're taking business away from the bigger banks. Loan demand is okay, but some of them are starting to bump up against the commercial real estate threshold. So just not a great time to be a banker. From the buyer's point of view, it's almost impossible to achieve the type of organic growth that's going to make your stockholders happy. So you've got to be looking to do deals to grow your top and bottom line and expand your footprint into other markets uh, in order to grow and keep your, your shareholders happy. So lots of reasons for smaller banks to sell, lots of reasons for mid-sized banks to be a buyer. We're still in that M&A sweet spot. It's going to continue for an extended period of time to come with 6,000 banks. I honestly believe we're going to, FJ Capital says 3,000, I say 2,000 banks uh, over the next, say, 10, 15, 20 years. And that presents an enormous opportunity for us as community bank stock investors. So let's uh, talk baseball. Okay, let's talk baseball. Let's get away from all the, all the markets and politics and bad stuff that's been going on in baseball. We had six division winners in our early season predictions. Had we bet on those, we'd have done very, very well. Did not get out uh, to place any small, even a small bet on that one. Uh, probably will for the playoffs, but uh, we'll see how this plays out. Had none of the wild cards, guys. I was just, you couldn't be any more wrong about the wild card teams uh, if you tried. I did not get a single wild card correct. So that, if you bet on that, that was money for you. But net on that with the six division winners, you came out okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this. 
Boy, I want to say the Minnesota Twins because that just would be a great story and it's what everybody's calling for. But that big three, the young three for the New York Yankees, Bird, Sanchez, Judge, I think it's too much. Uh, and one game playoff, those guys have a good day. Yankees win this thing going away. So I'm going to say the Yankees. And I really believe it's the Colorado Rockies over in the National League. I think they'll be able to deal with Arizona and set up just fantastic playoff season of baseball. Now, the betting side of me says the Washington Nationals and the Cleveland Indians. My the sports fan side of me says my nephews, Houston Astros, and the Chicago Cubs. I uh, would love to see that series. Uh, be tough for me to decide who to root for because I really do like my little nephew and he is a huge Astros fan, but I've always had something of a soft spot for the Cubs. And of course, the fact that my son-in-law lives right there and just maybe we'll be able to get tickets and go to a couple World Series games. Well, I'll try not to let that influence my thinking. Either way, it's going to be a fantastic uh, month of October for, for us baseball fans. So really looking forward to it. My wife and the youngest are going up to Chicago next weekend uh, for my da oldest daughter's baby shower, leaving the dog and I at home to indulge uh, in lots of playoff baseball, probably be some Popeye's fried chicken involved. Uh, we're just going to get wild and crazy over here and uh, tear up the cow. <laughs> so anyway, lots of exciting uh, uh, baseball coming up. College football, fun weekend. Navy won. Notre Dame, never, they shouldn't have been playing that team. It was just a horrible mismatch. But they won going away and are looking pretty good uh, as we go deeper into the season. Lots of great games around. The Florida game was good. Florida State, boy, if you're a Seminole fan, you're nervous. They just barely pulled that game out. Lots of stories developing in college football. Huge fan of the game. Looking forward to the rest of the season. So uh, on the book front, we did just finish Legacy of Spies. That's the new J John le Carre novel uh, based on the George Smiley group through all the British spies. It, you know, it's typical Akari. It's a fantastic read. If you have not already done so, get the book. It's a very enjoyable uh, several hour period of reading that book. He's a great writer, tells a great story, and a very unique voice among uh, spy and thriller, you know, action thriller novelists. So, um, just loaded up uh, the Kindle, a bunch of new stuff coming out. Uh, Napoleon's Pyramids. Uh, that's uh, kind of a, a Dan Brown type series. Uh, Hero's name is Ethan Gage. It was highly recommended to me by a friend. So we're going to try the first book in that series. I'll let you know exactly what we end up thinking of it. The new uh, Dan Coast, Coast book number eight is out. That's another one of those Florida kind of mystery detective series that I'm absolutely addicted to. It's a very worthy offering in the genre. If you're going to read the books, go back and start with number one. I'll be on number eight. Just enjoyable. Um, kind of brain candy type of read. And like I said, I've read them all. I've got seven or eight of these series that I follow religiously. This is the latest offering in that one. I'm looking forward to it. And then finally, we just started this one last night and uh, it was recommended in the New York Times book review. Reviewed, the reviews were fantastic. It's called Bluebird, Bluebird by uh, Attica Locke. And what a great story uh, of an African-American Texas Ranger uh, trying to solve some crimes over there in uh, the East Texas area, along Highway 59, the blues come into play. Um, so I'm not done with it, but about a third of the way through it, and I've got to tell you, it's a really enjoyable, extremely well-written book. So I highly recommend that one. So that's really about all I got for you this week. It's, uh, it's a stay the course market. Um, our stocks are mostly, for the most part, reasonably valued. Uh, biggest risk in the market remain geopolitical in nature. Some risk from the Fed, but that remains to be seen. So stay the course. We're not really an aggressive buyer. We're not an aggressive seller. We're just kind of in the sitting on our butts making money uh, position right now. Not horribly exciting, but wildly profitable. Now, if you have new money that you really must put to work or you're a new subscriber in the main portfolio, stick to those stocks on the buy list, buy rated bonus stocks. If you go back in the blog three or four weeks, there's a list of those. Uh, if you're a community bank stock investor, then stick with the focus stocks that in the issue I have rated buy and the two new picks. Okay, if you do that, I think we're going to stay out of trouble because those are all extremely well priced, well positioned, financially solid banks. Where I just don't think we're going to run into serious problems no matter what the market does. Now, if you're not a subscriber of the main portfolio product, banking on profits, 
or the community bank stock investor, ask yourself, why not? Uh, we're putting up huge returns with lower risk than the overall market. Uh, you get lots of good information about baseball, six division winners. You could have made some money there. And uh, some good stuff on recreational reading and new business and finance books. It's a nice package. If you're not already a member, consider joining us. Anyway, guys, that's it. Uh, it's going to be a very news-filled week. Las Vegas is going to dominate the news. We'll, we'll kind of learn more about that as things go along. Uh, the market's going to do what they're going to do. We're going to own our bank stocks, benefit from the M&A trend that's in place, and hopefully continue to profit at a very high rate for the rest of the year. Have a great week, everyone. This is Tim Melvin, and I'll talk to you guys next.